So thanks again for agreeing to be on Talks with Toss. Still fairly new, but I just thought your story was super interesting about coming from University of Guam, both exercise science graduates and kind of seeing full swing. Yeah, you're a full on coach now and athlete. And I just wanted to question, ask you questions about your experiences as an athlete, as a coach, all your current projects and what you're getting into these days and what the future is looking like for you. So we can just start with very simple introductions. Just tell us more about yourself. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, it's, uh... <laughs> It's 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 great to see how you know how far we've progressed in since college and just uh, kind of uh, making um, making a name for ourselves, right? So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I graduated in twenty thirteen uh, with a bachelor in science, right? Uh, <laughs> with in exercise health sciences with a concentration in exercise science and a minor in nutrition. So that's way back in. 2013 and it's not way back. It's not way, you know. I I graduated in 2015. <laughs> Same degree. Yeah, true. But I I am I am approaching a decade. You know, You're right. Since I graduated from college, so, so. Uh, here I am. I'm, I just turned 30. So it's a uh, it's a new decade to experience. Um, but yeah, so let me let me let me talk about myself, right? Well, um, so yes, I am currently I am a um, strength and conditioning coach and a weightlifting coach uh, for uh, a uh, Filipino Olympian um, in weightlifting, Heidelin Diaz. She is um, going to be a four-time Olympian. Um, and I started working with her in 20, the start, the end of 2017 to the start of 2018, I started working with her and it's been a long path and journey to get to the Olympics. Um, but yeah. yes, I, I did. I also do, I am also a remote coach. So I work with athletes around the world. I have athletes in, uh, Denmark, Italy, the U S Saipan, uh, Philippines, Singapore, Brunei, mm -hmm. uh, Spain, and Japan. So I have, I have athletes from around the world, weightlifters around the world. And I think uh, for me, being a former national team weightlifter, um, I, I kind of found a passion in coaching because I my athletic career uh, couldn't go as far as I wanted, but I shifted focus into coaching and I felt like I was a better coach than I was an athlete, but I do use my my training and being an athlete as a means for me to further my progression as a coach. That's awesome. Right, so, yeah, yes. kind of transitioning that experience and, and sharing that with the athletes you're coaching right now and training right now. Correct, correct. That's great. And so the Olympics is what, July 23rd, correct? Yes, we're about 15 days out till the start. Ooh. When are you heading yes. out? <laughs> we leave Malaysia on July 18th. Okay. So we have, yeah, a few more days, actually a few more weeks before we, we head out. So right now our preparation is, 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 um, has been more so towards focused on, uh, mental conditioning because i think strength wise we're, we've already met where we need to be uh, mm -hmm. so now it's mental conditioning so preparing my athlete mentally and also just um fine-tuning any quirks in the technique okay i meant to ask this later on in in our talk but since you brought it up that's such an interesting component as as a coach how do you how do you navigate that with your athlete in, in preparing them mentally because it's a highly stressful environment they're on the platform by themselves she's a four-time olympian so I, I i can imagine the the pressure is just astronomical can you talk a little bit more about how you go about that with with heidelin well you know um a lot of my specialty 
um, in coaching that I've acquired through the years um, because of the, the psychology courses I took in my curriculum. Um, it, it prepared me to really understand my athletes. Uh, it prepared me to really, um, you know, kind of empathize and to be able to, to work with their mindset. But, you know, behind there also is, is not only just me as a strength and conditioning and weightlifting coach, but she also has her head coach, which is focused primarily on the weightlifting aspect. And she also has a nutritionist and a exercise uh, psychologist. So all of us kind of work together um, to meet one goal, one standard. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think like for me, as from the mental aspect, it's really about in training, because I do the programming, in training, it, it basically comes down to um, adjusting on a needs basis. So like with weightlifting, um, you generally have the specific parameters for your training, the percentages, and um, you can even go by the RPE model. But really what, what, what we essentially do is we adjust based on how the athlete feels. So like for the day, if the athlete doesn't feel so well, um, then I adjust the sets and reps depending on that. And that kind of takes away the athlete's mental capacity in terms of having to think about what's next. We just yeah. say, look, do this. Don't worry about it. Do what you need to do. You lift, you focus on that. Um, and with that, we, we make sure that we fine tune as coaches and all of that. We fine tune all of the, the necessary components that need to be changed in training. That's awesome. I love the team approach. Love it. Uh, yes. It's all about collaboration for sports <laughs> sciences. Heck yeah. So going back to what we were talking about earlier uh, with you transitioning from an athlete to a coach, what was that moment or that instance that kind of was the catalyst of you wanting to be a coach? And I'm gonna do it in, and take that first step to being a coach and where you are now. I think the catalyst was my injury. Um, mm -hmm. I had a, I had a really serious injury. I had, um, I have isthmus spondylolisthesis. It's a very complicated, um, it's a very complicated terminology, but it's, yeah, it was a grade two. So about, uh, just about 50%. Um, mm -hmm. my L5, uh, was, um, well, basically how it happens is your part differences, which are the bones in your vertebra that connect like this were, mm -hmm. um, somehow fractured it could have been when i played american football could have been when i did jiu-jitsu but it was one of those sports where i may have fractured it a long time ago and basically uh in most cases uh, most athletes don't know they they have this injury mm. and so i guess it's progressed to 50 percent. and i was feeling a lot of back pain when i was training back in early 2017 I felt a lot of back pain. I just, I didn't understand what it was. Um, and actually this started to happen after I competed in Turkmenistan. Um, and I had to drop weight. Um, I had to make a weight cut to 62 kilos. And it was a drastic weight cut because when I arrived in Turkmenistan for my plane, I was, I, I left Guam at 64 five and I arrived in Turkmenistan on 67. So I had five days to drop yeah. how many kilos. So I think that was also a part of it. I mm. didn't, I didn't have the best competition, but I, I made weight and everything was in the books. After that, I just have started to have so much back pain. I couldn't, I couldn't um, lift in, in some days. And so I basically, went to the Philippines, got some, uh, got my physical done, x-rays, um, and MRI. And, and little did I know I, I had this, uh, injury. So, so basically this injury was a career ending one. Uh, it was a tough, tough, tough situation for me because I finally found the sport that I felt that I can excel in. I made it into a national team and sports changed my life. Um, so, 
it was such a big thing for me to to to, um, to really try to get far in weightlifting because I loved it so much. I still do. And so I think that was the catalyst is just going through that big, going into the abyss. <laughs> um, I was so depressed and I like, I realized like, look, I mean, I, I've been coaching um, prior to, ever since my internship from college, I've been coaching. I've been um, working at a really great facility, um, learned from some of the best on the, on the island, um, the Klaus brothers and just being in a s environment where they really taught me how to to have fun but at the same time be the best coach you can be mm -hmm. and i can attribute a lot of my foundations in coaching um, with them and i appreciate them for everything they taught me and um of course this journey never ends as a coach you continuously learn and i i, I realize like look you know i love weightlifting how can i give back to the sport um that I love so much without, even though I can't compete and it just made more sense transition into coaching. I think I, you know, it took me a while to gain the, the courage to really get out there. Um, and of course, Highland didn't just trust me like that. You know, it, it took a long decision. Um, I left my job I had a full-time job. I worked as a filmmaker. Uh, on the side, I was still coaching and I left all of that behind to pursue this goal, this dream to see how it worked. And, and it wasn't an easy road. Nothing was handed to me. I literally had to work for it. And I realized, look, I, I'm, I think I'm a pretty decent coach. I, I'm, I was a decent athlete. I think that I can put these together and um, really help people. And that, that was my, my biggest dream uh, to become a coach is to help others because I didn't have that when I was young I was obese and all this stuff so all of the things from my past that really affected me attributed to where I am now mm -hmm. so it really got me to where I am it propelled me to where I am because of that so sorry it's a lot I said no yeah. no that it's a, I mean I didn't realize I, I don't this is my first time hearing about your injury and what a powerful experience it is to to take what is seemingly just the worst time in your life and pivoting instead to having this new type of goal, this new career, and then pushing through your, your comfort zones and risking it all because man, I, I can definitely not relate when it comes to injuries, but feeling, feeling like I, I had to give up rugby, so to speak, to go to PT school, um, give up everything back home with the Olympic committee um, and just everything that we are, we were comfortable. Cause I mean, we were always at the box at custom fitness uh, with the Claris yeah. brothers doing our thing, but I don't regret it at all. I really don't. And now like, for you, for me, I think we're both in better positions to help other people and to continue to grow those sports, which is awesome. And just seeing, seeing that, I feel like it's super common with coaches, especially quality coaches that are not just there to give you a program and, and that's it. Maybe change a few things, give you a few cues, but that emotional aspect that's tied to their why and the, the thing that pushes them to, to helping athletes be the best athletes that they can be. Those are the best coaches. Those are the coaches you want. And I think it's so important with kind of being consistent because you're right. Athletes don't just trust, trust coaches from the get-go, especially early on in careers, but you remaining consistent, you, you risking what you did to, to be that coach for Heidelin and stay, staying that route, persisting regardless of what the risks may be, regardless of the, the possible outcomes, because you had already been in that position where this sucks. I hate it. What am I going to do now? How can I contribute? How can I give back um, now that we're here? So that's awesome. I, I, I'm really glad you shared that because I'm sure it's not something that is just so, so willing to share, especially knowing that I'm going to, you know, put this out there for everybody to, to listen into, to watch as well. Uh, 
So that pretty much answers how you became involved with the Philippine Olympic Committee. Uh, do you have any, uh, I guess, reservations? Anything to add? <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> reserva <laughs> no, reservations when it comes to going to the Olympics, because this is your first time, uh, correct? That you'll, you will be a, yeah, coach, just... a part of an Olympic team with an athlete. Yes. Yes, this, 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 yeah, this is the first time. This is the, um, it's actually even, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's definitely the first time. It's, it's such a, I get, I'm getting anxiety because I, I want it to happen already. You know, we, it's like just from the delay with, with the uh, pandemic and everything, it was supposed to be last year. Right. And with the pandemic, it just pushed everything back another year. Um, and of course it, it altered a lot of the plans, but yeah, it's, it's, I mean, how it feels, it's just, it's surreal. I couldn't believe we'll get this far with everything we've been through. Um, it was a tough, tough Olympic pr preparation, especially because of the pandemic and, you know, every country responds, right. And we've been in Malaysia already for more than a year. Um, and it's, 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 it was so crazy how everything happened. We came here initially for a training camp prior to the Asian championships, which was a pre-qualifier for the, um, Olympics. for the Olympics. Yeah. And what happened was during the preparation, the lockdowns got imposed. So oh we were training in the national training facility from Malaysia. And then a month in, we find they, Kuala Lumpur imposed this lockdown and they kicked everyone out of the Olympic, I mean, the national training center from Malaysia. So from then on, we were scrambling and we decided, look, um, I think our best option now is to um, rent an Airbnb and we were doing our training in the Airbnb for oh my uh, gosh. the two or three months, maybe was it two months, two and a half, three months that we were in lockdown. Mm -hmm. So that I had to really adjust the programming. It was very disappointing that the Olympics got postponed, but we needed to keep going. So I transitioned a lot of our training um, and surprisingly enough, it preserved a lot of leg strength for Heidelin, which was such a gamble to take, but we did it. We imposed a lot of running in the training every day, just to keep our cardiovascular and our health and our immune system going. And then we were luckily able to, to rent barbells from a company here that distributes Aleco. So we had a Leco barbell and a Leco plates in a condo on the ninth floor. Oh. And we had rubber, we bought rubber mats and we were literally lifting in the condo. Like we can't drop the weights. We're doing squats, but we basically had to lift the bar up or the, the, yeah. the weights up to do the squat, you know? So we were basically living the lockdown dream, I guess, if you want to call it that. <laughs> And yeah, we were, we were just doing everything we can. And my, and this is where strength and conditioning really paid off because you can't do any weight really much at all. Any weightlifting for a while, we were training squats with, with a bamboo stick and, and water jugs before the barbells came. Oh my so God. the transition was, oh yeah, it's, and you know what? I think that's where the creative side came from when I was coaching, you know, back in Guam, because um, when I was, when I was teaching uh, CrossFit for a while, it made, when I was programming, I had my own uh, um, class yeah. <laughs> and, uh, with my boys, you know, my classmates and everything. And you, this is where the creative aspect of coaching came in. It's like, look, how can I give these people, um, these athletes, um, and some of them weren't even athletes. They were just hanging out with the boys, right? How, mm -hmm. how can I, how can I give them a training training? That's, that's one fun it's two that's challenging, but also three beneficial for them. And mm -hmm. this class was so successful for a while. And, um, it just, it just, it just made me more creative on how I would, uh, think as a coach, because it's it, with a coach, it's, it's, 
you know, it's important to, to be a textbook coach, yes, to have the textbook mm-hmm. knowledge, but also there's a, t- there's a time and place to, to get creative. Certain mm-hmm. sports can call for just simple textbook stuff, but also other sports can also cater to um, being a little bit creative. Like some people say like, oh, you, you know, some people have this belief where, oh, you're, you know, you don't have to just do the extraordinary to get the most out of athletes. Yes, that's true too. Mm -hmm. Um, But we have to understand that, like, as a coach, you continue to test, you continue to assess, you continue Mm -hmm. to find, at the end of the day, it's not about you as a coach, it's about the athlete. Mm -hmm. So you you find what works, what works best for them. Some of them can can be um, different from from what's on what's what is said in the textbook, you just make the small incremental adjustments. And if it works for them, if it makes them, you know, um, happy mentally, you know, then that, that's the way to go. Yeah. yeah. I, I doubt any book has use a bamboo stick <laughs> with water. Yeah. And I can only imagine yeah. just how, how fun that would be. And just like you said, that mental aspect as an athlete, I mean, geez, I, I didn't, I definitely didn't have a barbell during the, the lockdown period, but I just remember in the backyard, there was this large metal pipe I think it was for for water or whatever that dug up randomly when we were cleaning out the backyard and I used that to back squat I I mean I wasn't gonna buy equipment there's no way and so but that alone you just feel so 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 much more productive than if you did air squats it just feels better it feels more of a, of you definitely have more of an effort put in to to actually squatting so that that is definitely not found in textbooks at least from what i've read so far (laughs) yeah Um, so i mean imagine like even doing like like dips on a chair right like um dips on the chair or you elevate your feet on the couch uh, or doing um pistols seated pistols right from the couch or you know like there's there's so many and that's it's a good thing to understand functional fitness because you you kind of understand like oh wait i can just i can just work out with these things in the house but of course of course it's not going to give you the um, um, necessary strength gains needed to excel for weightlifting but at least it maintained what we needed to yeah because yeah. when we got out of quarantine and back into training um at least from the backyard uh, for at the gym for a little bit we realized like wow we made it like that training that i did paid off for the last Mm -hmm. two three months Mm -hmm. so it made me think like wow it's doable you know Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. usually i'm not a big advocate for running i'm not a running guy but (laughs) You know, it, it took a pandemic for me to run every day. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. <laughs> it, it was um, such a interesting experience because we've like, we've had to overcome a lot. And even just this pandemic alone, it's, it's such a mental, you need to have, like, you need to be resilient to get through this mm-hmm. mentally and physically. Definitely. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about your athletes online your remote coaching when when did you start to get into that and and how has that experience been for you so far wow you know remote coaching is i got got into remote coaching i think two years ago so back in 2018 2019 i started to really um along with my coaching i really started to build an instagram presence through um my filmmaking of weightlifting. So like I would film athletes in competition. So if you're familiar with like hook grip, ATG, those are people that I'm associated with. They're mm-hmm. friends of mine. Um, I met them through competition. It all started in Asian championships actually in 2019. So with that, I started posting videos of athletes lifting and then I would give my coaches perspective. Yeah. So that's when I started doing that. I started posting more about Heidelin's training, what we're doing, um, the kind of things that 
my perspective is. And honestly, it took a lot of courage because in the beginning, I didn't have a lot of confidence in my, like, oh, am I good enough? Blah, blah, blah. So it took me a while to actually get to that point of, you know, having the courage to post um, and give my insight because you have a lot of online coaches and like uh, people like um, Adam Horshing. Um, I've, I've, uh, Dr. Uh, Squat University, I don't know if you know him. Um, lo- there's a lot, like when you get there as a person on like social media, you'll have haters. So I was always worried about people hating. I was always worried about all that stuff, but I realized like, you know what, um, this is bound to happen. And so I realized like, look, I'm here to help people. And if people don't want to be helped, that's okay. They don't have to like my content. They don't have to. Because I know there will be people who like my content. So the time and effort to film the athletes, to edit, to put to to really think about like the coaching aspect of it. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to spread awareness of weightlifting, but also give my coaching perspective. And with that coming, with that happening, people started messaging me like, hey, I'm interested in your your rates or like what your coaching stuff is. And I realized like, wow. I didn't, I didn't realize that this would happen. So, so then, um, yeah, I started to get people reaching out and then I started working with people. Initially I started at a pretty low price range and then I realized like, man, my worth is, is, is more than what I'm charging. And I was always pushed, pushed to, to charge more. So, um, you know, it's not a, uh, to be honest, like you don't do, you don't do like exercise science to, to become rich. Right. It's really about, um, you know, if you look past the money aspect of it, the financial aspect of it, it's a lot more rewarding when you're able to see your athletes succeed. Mm -hmm. I'm working with, wow, almost five of my, five athletes I work with are almost in the national team. Two of them are in the national team, one from Japan, one from Spain are in the national team. Of course, Harlan is a national team athlete but she's not remote. I have an athlete from Singapore who's in the national team now. Yeah, he is in the national team. Then I have an athlete, uh, two athletes from Brunei who are like in the cusp of being in the national team. And imagine this is remote coaching. It's a lot harder than one-on-one coaching, which I specialize in too. But I think like with remote coaching, it really challenges you. And it's a lot of work because these athletes are in different time zones. So it's, it's a lot of time in emphasis in the coaching, like programming aspect, but also being there. Um, I realized that there are a lot of coaches, remote coaches who charge a lot of money who aren't there for the athletes every single day. Like they'll send their videos, but they'll only answer once a week. I have me, I answer every day. So it's like, I go through 20, 30, up to 50 videos a day Mm -hmm. looking at technique how we can improve planning for the athlete and also doing conference calls with them Mm -hmm. you know so um but yeah it started from small where i had one athlete two athletes and then for some reason when my online presence became when i passed the twenty thousand mark in followers that's when i really started to get more um athletes following me and just seeing what i do and they're interested in getting coaching because that's what the pandemic actually started with people working from home or wanting to get online coaches so timing of it all (laughs) yeah so you can say that the pandemic was a blessing in disguise you know Mm -hmm. one it gave us more time to prepare for the olympics and now Heidelin is in the best shape of her life. That's like awesome. she's, she's, she's snatching and clean and jerking gold medal numbers. Oh my gosh, so exciting. And, <laughs> yeah. And at 30 years old, she's hit lifetime PRs. I didn't know so, she's 30. Yes, she's 30 years old. We're, we're the same age. She's 30 years old. Uh, she's been in the sport for 19 years. And, you know, if you want to attribute like her success, it's similar to Manny Pacquiao. She, like, she came from nothing. And that's what really drew me to her was she came from nothing. She, her family's poor. And to be able to win a medal in 2016 
the first she's the first female olympian to win a medal for the philippines and this this tokyo will be it's now people are waiting for the first gold ever for the philippines so this will be a big thing right um when she wins gold so <laughs> uh, i can't wait to watch oh my goodness. it's going to be interesting Let, let's let's see how um it play it pans out yeah um we're preparing for this like we asian championships wasn't the best competition because it just wasn't the the we didn't have the full team there's just a lot of circumstances and 15 months um since highland has been on the competition floor so mm -hmm. you have to imagine like if you haven't been on a platform for 15 months it's going to be a lot of nerves yeah so now we're prepared we're ready we learn from our mistakes in asian championships and we're ready to to bring a gold. I mean, as a Gomanian, as someone from Guam, from a small island in the Pacific, mm -hmm. it's such a crazy experience, you know, to 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 get on this international stage. So, point being, why I had to, to talk to you before you head out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true, and I really appreciate it. like just yeah. Um, still a lot to achieve i mean i'm still very young and i think that's that's what it is for us professionals you know like we're we're very young so a lot of people think like, oh they're young they don't know they don't have the experience but you know let, let's let's have our knowledge and actions you know change their minds right mm -hmm. so yeah that's 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 um essentially it <laughs> <laughs> so how many how many athletes are you currently coaching online Good question. <laughs> I think I have. I'm pa I'm I'm literally getting past my limit. Um, I think fifteen maybe. Awesome. Twelve to fifteen, mm -hmm. but some of them are like some of them are projects. You know, like I have a youth athlete from the Philippines. He's a youth record holder in powerlifting, but he wants to learn weightlifting. So oh. I coach him just out of like his family like his family's not really uh well off so i'm kind of doing it as a way to give back so i'm i'm giving him coaching and and um programming so that he can eventually make his way into the national team uh, for philippines he's a young boy very strong and i'm also working with grassroots uh, athletes here in malaysia but one-on-one -on -one, they join us in their training so i work with these kids in the place we're in right now in Malacca um, we're in like the province area mm -hmm. so we have these kids from like the province um, the villages that come to our gym and train with us and they've they've oh man, they they progress so quickly and I think that's what what I love is the fact that I work with grassroots so like the kids I work with elite athletes I work with recreational athletes mm -hmm. and I also have a 40 year old athlete, like I have a master's athlete in the US who um, didn't do well in nationals, but won the master's championship. Hey. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, Impressive. it's, it's, I have a, quite a resume of athletes, but um, of course, you know, there's a lot of work that goes into it. And I think the limit is already there, the threshold in terms of how many I can handle because um, it's a lot of late nights. Um, yeah. being able to to cater to these athletes especially because of my 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 why right um i want to be there 110 percent. you know i want to give them everything every uh, everything i can give the best coaching i can so. so speaking of which how how do you balance being an athlete and being a coach I know, I know you still do some weightlifting. I know you haven't parted ways completely, Jules. Oh yeah, I train, <laughs> I train six days a week. I train six days a week. I train. I do double sessions. Basically, essentially, it's it's a rule again. You know, it's a rule I learned right. Here. Like not to coach and not to lift at the same time. Right. That's something. It's basic. Right. Coaching one on one. But um, my athlete. I guess it, it also depends on the level of the athlete, the experience level, right? I have an elite, elite athlete who wants me to train too, you know? And, and I guess from her perspective, it makes sense because um, they want me to understand what I'm programming because my program is not easy, 
you know. Mm-hmm. I have to work with the the weightlifting coach who's a Chinese um, coach from China, and you also have the language barrier there. Mm-hmm. Then um, I have to adjust his programming and work with his programming because his programming is very basic. Um, and then my programming has everything from prehab, warm up prehab, mm-hmm. to accessories for weightlifting, and then strength and conditioning to prevent injuries. So a lot of the science goes into my program, while a lot of the basic Chinese methodology of programming in her weightlifting has happened. But I have to do a lot of the necessary changes for for us to work on the athlete's weaknesses. And so you so, you almost you train as though you're basically testing out the programming at the same. Correct. Time. Yeah, okay. because bef- before I program for my athletes, uh, I I test it myself. Yeah. You know, granted that I that I have an injury, mm-hmm. um, and I'm told not to live, but I realize, you know, um, the physical aspect is important, but the mental really gets you. And I think that mm-hmm. if I stop the weightlifting altogether. Or if I got my surgery to to fix my back, I'd be out of I I'd have to learn how to walk for six months, you know, and how learn how to walk for six months. I'd be out for six months, and I think that would put a a big toll on my mental, you know, my my uh, mental health. So I think at this moment, while I still can, I'll lift because I need to be that example for my athletes. I need to lead by example, you know. I, I always tell my athletes, say, look, you know, you're complaining about this. If you're going to complain about this program, I'm doing this too. <laughs> so what's your excuse? I have a broken back. What's your excuse? Mm-hmm. You know, so it shows like, like, it's okay to be honest with me. If you're feeling tired for the day, I will adjust your program. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're unhappy with the program, tell me, I'll make it more interesting. You know, it's really about communication. And that's the important thing. Like as an athlete, I learned like communication is important. I need to communicate to my coach. Like, look, I'm not happy with the program. I'm not progressing. I'm following it to the T, but I'm not progressing. Is there anything else you can change? Because I don't like for me, I don't like one program for everyone. It doesn't work that way, especially for weightlifting. And yeah, imagine the hours I spend programming because I make every athlete's program different based on what I th- see their weaknesses are. Mm-hmm. So I spend at least five to uh, six to eight hours on programming for how many athletes, mm-hmm. right? And um, uh, it's a lot of work. And like, I think a lot of the re- realizations being an athlete was like, wow. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't give my coaches enough credit, you yeah. know, <laughs> I didn't give them enough credit. Like I thought like, oh, they're just, you know, there to give me program, blah, blah, blah. but I didn't realize like, okay, so this is what it's like, you know, to work with athletes. Like I worked with, I mean, when I was coaching back in Guam, I worked with different sports, right? But we had one basic goal, you know, get them conditioned, get them stronger teach them weightlifting, you know, teach them, teach them how to be creative with your programming. How will it uh, translate into this? And like, there's some people on, on Instagram that have really good um, information on how to translate certain things out. There's a guy, I think a real game athletics, he does a lot of like sports specific strength and conditioning stuff, but he has squad university who teaches you from a, from a PT's perspective. And honestly, from a PT's perspective, I am so glad that I interned under a physical therapist because it made me understand how prehab works. You know, and now I, you know, a lot of weightlifting coaches don't prescribe prehab to their athletes. So it's a good thing that I worked under a PT, a good one, who was more catered to sports. It's a good thing I worked under him because I learned so much about um, cause I had my, my fair share of injuries, wrist injuries, shoulder injuries, and you know, he helped me get, get through them. Right. And it made me understand like, look, I'm not a PT, but it's important for me to, to work with a physical therapist, especially for weightlifting, mm-hmm. to work with a physical therapist, to see what helps, what works best for my athletes. Exactly. So, and I, that's my advocacy is 
also to um, share the importance of collaboration between sports science professionals. Mm -hmm. That's that's really an important thing that I learned as well as from from transitioning from athlete to coach. Yeah, it's just working together. Oh yeah, really, really. Why I started talks with Toss is to learn from. It gives me an opportunity not only to learn from the people I interview, but for other people to learn and to connect, because I think you're so right. It's so important that we could be so um, tunnel visioned in our in our lanes, like whether it be PT, uh, weightlifting coach, uh, athletic trainer, anything, anything within the health science, within the sports science field, or even just rehabilitation field. But so much can come out of those collaborations and the, that communication piece and talking about resources along the way, having those mentors, having coaches yourself, and then building those skill sets in, in coaching and for you specifically like filmmaking and, and being tech savvy, being able to basically send out programming and communicate with people from different parts of the world so those things aren't, you know, always highlighted when it comes to, you know, whether it be an undergraduate degree in health science, whether it be a doctorate degree in physical therapy, or a degree in athletic training. And so those things, I think, are so invaluable to your success as a professional. And so with those, with that being said, as far as those resources, are there any other things that helped you along the way outside of having those mentors, having that communication skill with coaching, all of those experiences? I think a lot of this, a lot of it attributed to my upbringing and also all of the hardships I've experienced, um, not just from growing up, but just even in recent times. I think a lot of it attributed to that because I've always had this, I always grew up feeling like I needed to prove myself. I always grew up feeling like um, I need, in order for me to make change, I need to really sacrifice. I need to really put in the work. And mm -hmm. um, in the last decade, in my 20s, I know that I did that. I mean, there's still more to do, but I'm still very young. There's still more hardships I need to experience, still more challenges that'll come. <laughs> but I, I think those were a big learning, you know, it, it taught me a lot about life, taught me a lot about like mm -hmm. also leaving Guam. I don't think that if I didn't leave Guam, I would never experience, you know, like because it's so easy to get complacent back home. Oh, yeah. Like, like right now I'm homesick. Like I'm really, really homesick. But I also don't regret leaving because it was such a nerve wracking thing to leave a full time job, um, to leave everything I know, right? Mm -hmm. And to be out in the Philippines, for instance, um, which is like my father's side, I'm half Filipino, right? So it's like, oh, you know, maybe it'd be an easy transition, you know? I don't know how to speak the garlic, but. Um, you know, I left, I, and wow, it's such a culture shock. The mindset, you know, it's very similar, similar traits to what Guam, you know, but it's just such a different experience being in a big city. Like I realized how naive I was being from a small <laughs> island. Oh gosh, me too. <laughs> you think, <laughs> yeah, you think everyone's friendly, you know, you think everyone <laughs> has your back. Everyone's legitly like nice. But I realized, like, no, people will just, you know, pretend to, like, be your friend so that they can, you know, use you, you know, things like that. Like, you realize, yeah. like, wow, you know, because especially you're a foreigner, it's very easy for you to, um, for people to want to take advantage of the fact that you're a foreigner. So, mm -hmm. but it, it taught me a lot. It taught me a lot about how, how fortunate I was to be born and raised on Guam. Okay. How fortunate I was to get the education that I got, to meet the people that I got, to to have the internship that I got, to have all of these things. Yeah. You know, 
we're very, very, very fortunate. But it also reminded me, like, look, I'm not from a rich family either. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a time where my family was doing pretty, pretty good, pretty well off. But then um, the financial crisis back in 2008, was it 2008 happened where we, we had inflation, right? Mm -hmm. And my, um, you know, my mom lost her job. She had a really good job, lost her job. And we went from middle class to like, okay, you know? So I understood what it was. And in college, I had to, to fund myself, you know? Um, so I understood what, I understood a little bit of what struggle was, but it wasn't until I got out, I left Guam where I realized we are so lucky. Mm -hmm. We are mm -hmm. so fortunate to be from Guam, to have people who care. Of course, you'll have bad apples in Guam, but in, in most cases, the, the island culture is so, is so good. It's all about family. Yeah, it's so, so good. good. And when you go into like somewhere else, you're just like- We can talk like, all day about this. We can literally yeah. talk all day about the struggles <laughs> of being removed from the island life. Yeah, <laughs> it's-, it's ridiculous um <laughs> just just different mm -hmm. but you know what um it just makes you understand like you know like for me it made me understand why my 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 parents you know left my mom left japan why my dad was removed from the philippines it made sense you know it's better life that a uh, more simple life rather mm -hmm. um and so yeah, it's just just going through that, the learning experience, meeting these different people, like it's a dog eat dog world, you mm. know, especially from a professional setting too. Like the strength and conditioning market in the Philippines is very saturated, mm. very toxic. It's just um so you know, you'll have a lot of people that will hate. Mm. You have a lot of people that will be envious, you know, but not a lot of people know the story, you know, of yeah. how I became a coach and all that stuff. So a lot of sacrifices. Oh, definitely. You can only imagine, yeah. <laughs> seriously. But I can relate with leaving everything behind and living in a completely different place. Um, but it's such a transition. Yeah, realizing though at the end of the day, I owe a lot to this experience. I really do. Um, and I, and I, I don't think I would have changed it. You know, if I could go back, I don't think I would have, but yeah, <laughs> for, for anybody listening for, for current coaches or people considering coaching, is there, what advice would you give if any? Don't be afraid to fail. Mm. Don't ever be afraid to fail. Failure is part of that journey. I failed so many times when I started out. I've made so many mistakes when I started out, mm -hmm. but it it made me more hungry. Don't get also complacent. Always educate yourself. Always test, always assess, always find what's best. Remember, it, as a coach, it's not about you. It's about your athlete or your athletes. Mm -hmm. So you have to make sure that everything you do, you you focus on the goal instead of what you feel. Of course, when it comes to working with athletes, when it comes to you as a coach, as a person, do what makes you happy. Do find the best resources to help you become better. Um, continue to continue to learn, continue to, to, to grow. Don't be afraid to make mistakes and always, always find a solution. That's what I would say. I love it. I love it. Always test, always set, assess, always find what's the best. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. It's not just one thing that I'll prepare for everyone. That's, and that's, that's the challenge. That's the journey of coaching, right? Mm. So, <laughs> so Jules, where can people connect with you? Um, yeah, I have an, I have an Instagram. It's at I'm Julius. I am Julius. Letter I, letter M, Julius. And I also have a Facebook. You can follow me or like my page on Facebook. 
just search Coach Julius Naranjo. You can actually go to my link in my bio of my Instagram, and it has it has all the links to my socials. One stop shop. So at I, yeah. <laughs> I M yes. letter M as in mom. <laughs> um, yes, Julius. And so last question, most important question. Okay. Where can you, uh, what is your favorite muscle? I, I don't know why I just said that. What is your favorite muscle? <laughs> That's a good one. If it's a, if, if that, if you can't answer that, we can, we can pivot. We can ask what your favorite list, your lift is, your favorite lift. I can't speak tonight. What is wrong with me? It's okay. Uh, well, I think my favorite, okay. I can answer both if you'd like. Yes. Um, my, my favorite muscle, my favorite muscle would be the glutes. <laughs> I don't know why. I like the glutes because, the because, um, yeah, you generate power from the glutes, your hips, I guess. Yeah. If it's muscle, then, then, then glutes, if it's area, then I would say the hips, of course, because it's, it's so vital. It's so vital in, in, in the sport of weightlifting. It's so vital, vital in a lot of sports. Uh, if you want, you generate a lot of explosiveness from your glutes and your and your hips in general so i find them and also it's 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 glutes are nice so, uh, i was like wait for it wait for it i know you're waiting for it that's right like, i don't know what else i mean like i guess yeah favorite lift favorite lift okay my favorite lift okay let's transition let's segue into my favorite lift <laughs> my favorite lift is actually the snatch um <laughs> You know, I love the snatch because it's such a difficult, uh, it's such a technical movement. When I first started weightlifting, I realized I loved the snatch more than any other exercise because when I was so horrible at cleans, I just, <laughs> I just, I just, I, I like cleans, but I didn't like it more than the snatch. I love the snatch because I love being able to lift quickly, to lift with good technique and to be able to get that weight overhead. So that, that, I mean, just the technical aspect of it and the amount of power plus speed that's needed. Yeah. Um, it's such an amazing movement. I love this snatch so much. And I've been buried by the snatch, meaning the bar fell on me so many, like, I think mm. once. The bar fell on me once ever. And that was such a crazy injury. That was when I was um, first starting out, like, when, I don't know, when I was already a few months in and getting close to being in the national team, I, <laughs> the snatch followed me and that was such a learning experience. And I realized like, how much weaknesses I had, how much shoulder stability I needed, core stability, and how much more precise my, my technique needs to be. So that's what drew me more and more interested in the snatch because of just the technical preference. In clean and jerky, you just need power and oh, the technique is important, but you need a lot of power and a lot of strength. It's more brute strength in the, in the clean and jerk, but just the, the technical, um, being able to be a technician was important to me and i love that's what i loved most about the snatch awesome well thank you so much again jules for getting on talks with toss <laughs> this morning thanks for, for having this me. evening for me geez yeah, yes no. it's so late <laughs> and, uh, that's probably why i just can't speak and i don't know how to read apparently but you know that's whatever it's <laughs> fine um it's okay so yeah, I, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about you personally and then just even things as an athlete, things as a coach. I am very happy. I'm glad we got to, to talk tonight, but thank you again. I hope you guys do freaking awesome in Japan. Woo! Thank you. We'll be thank watching. You. Sorry. We'll do our best. We'll do our best. <laughs> no, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, really excited for you guys. Safe travels. All the best to Heidelin and Team Philippines. I'm so awesomely proud of you representing Guam too. So, man, get it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. It's going to be such an experience. Um, I'm excited for it. And thank you so much for uh, giving me the time to speak. I, I want to really contribute it somehow to the island in any way. Um, mm -hmm. And I think being, helping this grow, you know, 
uh, doing these talks to you. I, I really want to support you too with what you're doing. Oh, thanks, Jules. You know, talk about putting putting myself out there, right? Com comfort zones and stuff. But yeah, yes. so, <laughs> you know, right? I mean, I was like, ah, oh, whatever. Let's just do it, Tossie. Just do it. I'm like, what what have you got to lose? Do Nobody it. watches. Okay, that's fine. I learn. At least it, you're doing it. Yeah. At the end of the day, I learn. You know.